Tom. All right. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, before I start, I have two things I would like to say. And the second one's a question, the first one's something. So this is my first pal for you guys after um, teaching you guys last year on Sayyid Muhammad, uh, the cell communication lecture. And I wanted to say this one thing is that I am extremely proud of all of you. It really makes me happy to see that you've all made it this far. And inshallah, there's a lot farther to go and you guys are killing it. And I never really had another PAL session to tell you guys how proud I am of everything that you've been doing, but I really am. And I hope you know that, all of you really, in your whole batch. But medicine is not easy. You didn't choose an easy field. It's very difficult and it's really, it's really challenging. And sometimes your, your mentality is going to be completely strange. But you've made it this far, and trust me, you will keep fighting. Neuro is defeatable. I also know that there are people here who were with me last year, but unfortunately did not make it through the year. And I know they're taking Neuro or POD again or the year again. And I just want to say I'm proud of you guys too. To pick up the pace and to go fight this fight again is truly something that you should be proud of. And trust me, Neuro is defeatable. Allah you will get through this. And of course, to the people who were with me in first year but had to repeat the year, that's all right. Look how far you've made it. You are doing incredible. And really, to all of you, I am so proud of you for making this far. And I really hope you keep going further. And I really hope that one day I'll be able to trust you with my life. The second thing that I'd like to, and this is the question, is I know I can make this interactive or I can explain and just answer when you guys have questions. But do you guys want me to interact like somewhat or do you guys just want me to like just stick pure lecturing? Uh, you can answer in chat, we'll uh, unmute your mics, Hadi. Okay, so I'm not talking about questions. I'll, I'll save, um, I'll say like, again, I'm not going to, I'm going to take questions at specific parts, but um, ju just for the sake of, um, okay, خلاص, good to interact. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about spine stuff. Now, according to Khalasi uh, and Khalid, my main focus is going to be ascending and descending. So because of that, my main focus will be ascending and descending. But I will cover a few things from the basics, which I feel are important. And I will drop a few things from the uh, injuries lecture, just because I feel like they might make your life easier uh, having them now. So if we haven't met before, my name is Lati. I'm a third year medical student, alhamdulillah. If you have any questions whatsoever, has, don't hesitate to reach out to me, however you feel, whether it's email, phone, or just yelling at me in the hallways, whenever you see anything works. So now let me go to the actual slide, which is the spinal, let me use a laser pointer. How else do I have to? Um, where is the, oh wait, it's right here, sorry. Sorry guys, give me a second. Okay, so yeah, this was the spinal nerve and spinal cord lecture by Dr. Yaqid Dean. This lecture does not, this, my slides are not 70 slides like yours, mainly because I took a lot of things that I felt were repeated out. And I'm also going to show you why Dr. Yaqid Dean is such an amazing doctor and why he truly is the goat. So yeah, oh, so trigger your warning. You're going to see some really, really terrible jokes. So please bear with me, but terrible jokes is how I got through Nero. And inshallah, I hope that if this is the only thing that you have, I hope this is what helps you get through. I forgot the animations. All right, let's start off with here. This is something very basic. Let me hide the controls. Um, yeah, okay. So this is something really basic, but something I'd like to cover. And this is the spinal cord in general. So by now, you guys should have an idea of what the difference is between the spine and the spinal cord. Can someone just quickly say just something very small about it? Like what, what the difference is? Okay, I do whatever. Like the difference between the spinal cord and the spine is when we talk about the spine, we're talking about everything. We're talking about this whole thing. The spinal cord is this line right here. I know. And it's a quite nice looking line. It's a very important line. It's protected by your vertebrae and it's very, very important. Uh, and a kid, you guys would know why it's not, why it's important. And if not, well, that's what this lecture is for, the importance of the spine. So we have five segments technically of the whole spine. We have the cervical segment, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and the coccygeal or the coccyx. Um, so the cervical, as you know here, we have, we kind of have like this bulge looking like structure. And this is the brachial plexus. This is for, because we have the brachial plexus here. We also have a bulge looking like structure in the lumbar nerves and the sacral nerves, the lumbosacral plexus. 
And this is because you need more nerves to supply your limbs and extremities. And you'll see that more. I'll keep repeating this. The other thing that's going on here is that we have in the spinal cord ends some point around here, L1, L2. And why is this important? Well, you guys are going to take something called um, lumbar, uh, lumbar tap or lumbar tap, spinal tap, uh, lumbar puncture. Yes, lumbar puncture, spinal tap. It's a very fun pro skill, very hard, but it's really fun. And you're really going to want to do the skill uh, if you get it right, at least. And so, yeah, like I said, it ends at L1, L2. And then you have this coccygeal nerve right here. This area is called the phylum terminale. So it's kind of like a single file and it's pretty much the last part. Also, this cone looking like structure, which is part of the sac which, which is part of the saco segment, this is called the um, conus medullaris. So it's a cone, really. And why would it be called medullaris? So if you guys remember from the very first lecture of neuroanatomy, you in the brainstem, you have the midbrain, you have the pons, and then you have the medulla. So after the medulla, you have the spinal cord. So the conus medullaris, I guess it kind of makes sense. The last thing that's important is something here called the cauda equina. The cauda equina is this group of nerves over here. And the reason it's called the cauda equina is because it looks like a horse tail. Now, cauda means tail or rear of something. And equina means horse to some extent. I'm not sure what language. I don't want to say it's Latin and it turns out I'm wrong. But I know it's some one of, one of those weird languages like Latin or Greek or whatever. But it pretty much means horse tail. If you don't know what a horse looks like, this is, uh, this is Bojack Horseman. And if you don't know what a horse tail looks like, this is a horse tail. Um, and if you know anything about Bojack Horseman, he doesn't have a ho horse tail outside. He has a horse tail in his spine. They call it a coin. Anyways, here are more pictures of things I talked about. These are the layers. You'll see this more in the base. This is more important for like the very first lecture. I don't, it's not very concerning within the um, spinal lecture. It, and you'll probably see this stuff in lab, but really I'm just, concerned with the cervical enlargement, the lumbar enlargement, the conus medullaris, the, final ter the phylum terminale, and of course, although it's not shown here, the cauda equina. So another concept that's important to understand about the spine is that the amount of, excuse me, the amount of cervical vertebrae and the amount of cranial nerves we have isn't the same. So we actually, so just to look, and instead of like going on about, oh, this and this, because I'm sure you would have probably understood this, Memorize this. Now, why do I want you to memorize this? Because you're going to get a question on this. No, I want you to memorize this because understanding this could be in a question stem. So they may, so uh, they may ask you, for example, what um, I, I don't know. Maybe the question is relating to the nerve uh, at the tenth thoracic vertebrae or whatever. So just memorize this, not for the sake that a question will come out of it just for the sake of being able to understand the question. This is a very important slide. This slide is probably one of the most important in the basics lecture, um, besides another slide. So with this slide, we see the spinal cord, but I'm not really concerned about anything here besides the vasculature. So we have this artery right here. This is called the anterior spinal artery. And then behind, we have the two posterior spinal arteries. Now, the anterior spinal artery, is going to supply the anterior two thirds, whereas the posterior two spinal spinal arteries are going to supply the anterior of uh, the posterior one third. So just to repeat, anterior spinal artery, anterior two thirds, posterior spinal arteries, anterior uh, posterior one third. Now there's a very simple way to remember this. But I need I need a volunteer just to speak just to speak. Uh, if anyone doesn't mind. Yeah. I was going to call on you anyways. This, yeah. Like Yusuf, can you tell me what happened here in this picture? Uh, Saudi Arabia won uh, the World Cup, basically. Exactly, exactly. Like in this, in, in this, um, in, in this very, um, very historical game, what was the score? Two one. Exactly. So why is so that why would two one be important? So it's it's very stupid, and you probably would are already able to memorize this. But if you're if you if not, this is a very stupid way to remember it. So pretty much, we have two for one and one for two. You have one anterior spinal artery for the anterior two thirds, and you have two posterior spinal arteries for the posterior one third. A two one with two one. Thank you, Yusuf. But yeah, that's very very. Weird way to remember it, but I did tell you guys that there will be some terrible jokes here, so please cope. All right, let's move on. 
I don't know why the animation is there. I'm not going to explain this slide. I honestly just copy pasted this from the transcript and that's pretty much it. Actually, you know, I will explain the slide. I, I like this slide. I feel like it's important to explain. I take that back. Anyways, um, I want someone besides Yusuf to volunteer because I do have a question and people tend to get mixed up with this. But can someone else volunteer? Hi, Rafi. Hi, Sara. Okay, Sara, uh, look at, can you see picture A? Yes. Okay. So which, I want you to tell me which one is the white matter and which one is the gray matter? It's so really hard. Inside. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding. The inside is the white matter. The inside is the white matter and the outside is the gray matter? Yes. Unfortunately, you're not correct. Oh, spinal cord, it's that, switched. Exactly, so in the brain, if you saw this in the brain for some reason, you should probably call a doctor because your spine should not be in your brain. But if let's, let's say you saw something like the brain, or some, you saw something like this in the brain where the out where the court where the cortex was black and on the inside and within the inside it was white um like this so the outside would be the gray matter and the inside would be the white matter this is the opposite in the spinal cord this in this inside area is the gray matter and this outside area is the white matter why that's a great question ask the people who named this but what do i why do i care about the white matter and gray matter and what's an easy way just to remember this? If you're, if you're lucky enough to be given a cervical segment, this kind of looks like a horn. So you, and this horn is called the anterior gray horn. So it's a very important structure and I'll be talking about it in one of the upcoming slides. But this anterior gray, but if you see this horn like here and you know you're in a cervical segment, you know that this horn is the gray matter because it's called the anterior gray horn. Now, why is this anterior gray horn here? And why is the cervical big one so big? You may wonder. Um, the reason is, is like I said, you do have these enlargements at the cervical and the lumbosacral segments. And that's because in the cervical, you have to supply the brachial plexus, Whereas in the lumbar and the sacral, you have to supply the lumbosacral. So as you see, because it, it's so large, because you have to supply the brachial plexus. In the thoracic, there are no plexuses. So that's a good thing. So this kind, so you can just remember that the thoracic kind of looks like Loki's helmet. At least that's the way I see it. Um, and if you don't know who Loki is, um, you you've got to be really young, honestly, because like I, I feel like everyone here knows who Loki from Marvel is. Anyways, then we also have the lumbar. So the lumbar looks similar to the cervical. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, and I'll explain that why when I get to the sacral. But we also have those anterior gray horns that are quite large. And that's because it's supplying the lumbosacral plexus. Now the sacral, pretty small. Now I want you guys, you know what? I'll, I'll have more interaction later. You know, what? Uh, you know what? no, I'll interact now. So can someone tell me why the sacral is probably smaller than everything else? A different bond. Again, I just want different people to speak all the time. If, because uh, many of you said um, interactive. So can someone just tell me why the sacral is smaller than the others? That's, that's fine. So the sacral is smaller because it has less nerves, uh, just to put it simply. As you see, the spinal cord, you're going up and you're collecting more and more nerves. And that's why the cervical one is so huge. But the sacral, it, like again, we're looking at this area. It's not that big. So it's just a matter of understanding what you're looking at. And again, all of it's in writing here. So if you read this and told me that, that would have been fine. And um, Honestly, great job so far. We're almost done with the important basics. I think we have, yeah, this is the last slide from the important basics. This is a very important slide as well. Excuse me. So we have some nuclei here that we need to know. We already talked about the anterior gray horn in a little bit of detail or in, in a little bit of non-detail. So let's get a little bit more detailed with it. The anterior gray horn is motor. And uh, you guys can understand that it's motor because when you look at your brain, the frontal cortex is the motor cortex and behind it, you have the sensory cortex. So this is anything in the front, most likely would be motor. Anything in the back, most likely, again, not all the time, but most likely would be sensory. So we know these are sensory, these are motor. And the green is, we'll talk about that too. So the anterior gray horn has three parts. It has three nuclei, the medial, which is responsible for the neck and the trunk muscles. 
the central, which is responsible for the phrenic nerve. Does anyone remember their CVP first year? What's the phrenic nerve supply? Anyone can answer this. Uh, the diaphragm. The diaphragm, very good. Thank you so much. So the, the, cent the, cer the central nucleus supplies the, uh, sorry, the central, which is related to the phrenic nerve, supplies the diaphragm. And then we also have the lateral nucleus. The lateral one supplies the limbs. So this could be the brachial plexus or the lumbosacral plexus. And that is why the anterior gray horn is large in the cervical and the lumbar segments, like I said before. The, intermedi the intermediate lateral nucleus is extremely easy. Preganglionic sympathetic nervous system fibers. Just remember that. Don't, don't try to explain it, just remember that. Um, sympathetic chain ganglia, all of those words, this nucleus right here. These last ones, honestly, they're a little bit different from each other. So that's the only thing that makes it difficult to remember. But we have the substantia gelatinosa, the nucleus proprius, and the dorsal nucleus of Clark. So the cool thing with these two, this substantia gelatinosa and the nucleus proprius, is that they're throughout the whole spinal canal, whereas the dorsal nucleus is from C8 to L2 or L4, depending on the textbook. So let's start off with the substantia gelatinosa. The substantia gelatinosa is related to pain, touch, and temperature, whereas the nucleus proprius is related to conscious proprioception. And you see this proprius proprioception. Does anyone know what proprioception really means? Because I mean, I just want to make sure you guys know what it means, but can someone define it for me? What proprioception is? Um, feeling your joints and your muscles and where they are. Yeah, exactly. It's about the sense of location. Very good, Yusuf. Like, Yusuf, do you know the difference between conscious or unconscious? Like, what, like what's a very simple way to distinguish? So conscious is when you think about it, so you move your hand to pick something up, for example. And unconscious is like when you're walking up the stairs. All right, that's a really good, that's a, look, that's a good guess. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Like just, just because again, and you'll learn this in pro, conscious is um, when your eyes are open and unconscious is when your eyes are closed. Why did they call it unconscious and unconscious, conscious and unconscious? That's a great question. Um, this unconscious, eyes closed, and you'll see, you'll take specific skills that you require your eyes to be closed, like something like pronate, you're looking for pronator drift and things like that. But very good. Yusuf said that proprioception is kind of your, like your sense of your surroundings. But the nucleus proprius is for conscious proprioception. The dorsal nucleus of Clark is for unconscious proprioception. And the substantial gelatinosa is pain, touch, and temperature. When I was practicing this lecture yesterday, um, I was trying to think of a way where you guys could remember these things. So I, I, know, I knew and know the nucleus proprius would make sense. And the dorsal nucleus of Clark is next to it. So the function would somewhat be similar. But of course, there are different, like you could find some differences. Like proprius is conscious, dorsal isn't. Nucleus proprius is in the whole uh, spine. The dorsal nucleus of Clark is within C8 to L2. But I was thinking, how, how are you guys going to remember substantial gelatinosa? And then I thought of something. So the way you can remember it, if you don't already, is that gelatin, American gelatin, is haram. And if you touch gelatin with your mouth, you will, I mean, uh, again, I'm, don't take me from my word at this, <laughs> please. But it, and please do not be offended by what I'm going to say next. If you, let, if, you, in, if you keep touching uh, gelatin with your mouth, you will go to Jahannam, and Jahannam is very painful, and it's very hot. But pain, temperature, and touch. That's a very weird way to remember it, but if it works, it works. And honestly, the way I used to remember neuro, and the way I said you for neuro, is by remembering it in really, really weird ways. So if you didn't like that way, just cram it, pain, touch, temperature, substantial deltanosa, whole spine. But if you like the way I explain it, great, good for you. Um, I, and I hope some, I hope someone benefits, um, cause it's, it's too late for me to benefit honest. Alhamdulillah. But yeah, that's it from the basics. Does anyone have any questions so far? I, let me try, uh, Abdulazak, I can't see chat by the way. If anyone's asking anything, please, um, let me know. Oh, okay. No questions on that. No. Alhamdulillah. Okay, khalas. Um, I'll move on to what I'm supposed to explain. Now, generally with this lecture, with this whole like lecture, uh, with the descending tracts, I can pretty much explain everything here. This whole slide, I, I could just explain everything about the tracts here. I won't exactly do that, but I will show you 
and this is the part where I'm going this after this, you'll realize why Dr. Yaqim is very good at explaining lectures and why his style is really beneficial to you as a student. We have three main tracks, but before I get into oh, what these three main tracks are, we have ascending and descending tracks. Ascending means it goes up and descending means it comes down. Another thing you'll see is that when we were talking about ascending tracks, we're talking about a track going from, from somewhere, from the spine to somewhere in the brain. So that's why you'll see some of them called like spinal cerebellar, spinal thalamic, spinal reticular, spinal tectal. You'll see spine from it, it ascends from the spine to X parts of the brain. Descending is the opposite. It goes from X parts of the brain to the spine. So corticospinal, reticulospinal, things like that. But that's, a, that's just so you understand the difference between ascending and descending. Also ascending is sensory and descending is motor. Now, I could, get, I could get you guys lost here. So really, I need your attention now. So please, if you're not awake already, please do that. And if you need water, please drink. I'm going to drink some myself. Let's begin. So let's start off with the dorsal column. This is also called the posterior funicul funiculus and it's composed of two parts, the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cunatus. The gracilis is found more on the lower limb and the cunatus is found more on the upper limb. Essentially, they do the same thing. And we call them, we refer to them together as the dorsal column. The dorsal column is responsible for two touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception. Two touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception. So T, V, and C. How did I remember this in first year? Among my a friend group, infamous mnemonic, tobacco, vape, and cocaine. So tobacco for two touch, two, two touch discrimination, vibration, vape, and uh, cocaine, conscious proprioception. And another thing to remember is that this is the dorsal column. This is all the way at the back. So if in, in other schools, not in Faisal, if people are going to do these three things in class, they probably do them at the back. Stupid way to remember it. I told you, I'm going to bring you a bunch of random ways to remember things. But as long as you understand that the dorsal column it, the dorsal column is responsible for two-touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception, and you remember that the, facil the fasciculus cuneatus is more in the upper limb and the gracilis is more in the lower limb, you're good. So that's it for the dorsal column. The uh, spinal cerebellar pathway, it's composed of two parts, the posterior and anterior spinal cerebellar tracts. They go from the spine to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, so you guys have the cerebrum and then somewhere under your cerebrum towards the back around here you have the cerebellum the cerebellum is a very cool part of the brain and you I, you will learn about it soon not soon but you'll learn about it at some point in time. uh but it is but these two are both responsible for unconscious proprioception so the spinal cerebellar tracts are both responsible for unconscious proprioception this should also give you some sort of indication for the function of the cerebellum and i'll get into that i'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in the motor area but uh, just we'll, we'll we'll get back to that point the last major track that we need to talk about in the or actually let me just repeat the spinal cerebellar pathway has the posterior spinal cerebellar and anterior which both do unconscious proprioception and the, these are these two the last one is the anterior lateral pathway it com it's composed of an anterior part and a lateral part and they're both called the spinal thalamic tracts so you have the lateral spinal thalamic tract and the anterior spinal thalamic tract the lateral spinal thalamic tract is responsible for pain and temperature, whereas the anterior is responsible for touch and pressure. Also, these two will form will combine with the spinal tectal tract to form the spinal laminate. And you will see this in the brainstem lecture, inshallah. The spinal tectal tract is not a major tract. However, it is, it is important for vision. And that's pretty much all you need to know about it. Some other important tracts include the cuneocerebellar, which is very similar to the, to the um, spinal cerebellar in the sense that it also does unconscious proprioception. We also have the spinal reticular pathway. The spinal reticular pathway is responsible for consciousness. It goes from the spine to the, um, to the reticular formation. And pretty much, unless you see it here, there isn't much to know about it. And I'll show you one other slide because in another slide, we do talk about the cuneocerebellar. So let's just recap all of the tracts that are major. And uh, let's try recap all the tracts, sorry. So we have the dorsal column. The dorsal column is responsible for, for touch, two-touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception, TVC. 
it's composed of the fasciculus gracilis, which is more in the lower limb, and the cuneatus, which is more in the upper limb. We also have the spinocerebellar tract. The spinocerebellar tracts go from the spine to the brain, or to the cerebellum specifically. And they and the, they, the spinocerebellar tracts are responsible for unconscious proprioception. By then, we have the anterior lateral pathway or the spinothalamic tract, the lateral for pain and temperature, and the anterior for touch and pressure. And they will combine with the spinal laminate, with, with the spinal tectal tract to form the spinal laminate. Also, if you want an easy way to remember the spinothalamic tracts, each one has to have a PT of some, port, of some sort. So the, spine, the lateral will have pain and temperature, whereas the anterior will have touch and pressure. Like I, we also have three other tracts, the spinal tactile for vision, the spinal reticular for consciousness, and the cerebellar, which is also for unconscious proprioception. But did anyone get lost here? Yes. All right, which part? Um, when you came to the anterior lateral pathway. Okay, sure, let me repeat that. But the anterior lateral pathway is also called the spinothalamic pathway. Play it. So we have two parts of the spinothalamic pathway. We have the lateral spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract. The difference between them is that the lateral is responsible for pain and temperature, PT, and the anterior is responsible for pressure and touch, also PT. They will combine with the spinotectal tract to form something called the spinal laminate, which you will see in the brainstem lecture. So I won't explain that now. I'll let Maryam and Khalid explain that part. Is that more clear? Yes, thank you. Of course. Play. Anyone else lost about anything I've said? Okay, inshallah, nobody is. But if you are, one thing I used to do a lot in neuro, and this is another way I recommend studying, is in anatomy, draw. I literally have... I literally have this paper, right? This whole set of papers from all of my um, neuroanatomy drawings. And every time there's a structure that's important, I would draw it. And here I made a bunch for the um, spinal cord and the spinal cord ones were some of my favorites, to be honest. And this is among the reasons why I'm very happy for the Tasha lecture. So yeah, you guys can read this. I know my handwriting's bad and I don't know what, to, what else to tell you. And I, but I have everything labeled and everything I mentioned should be explained here. And if you can read my handwriting, amazing. You should be able to understand this. And I really do hope you guys end up understanding this, inshallah. Now, we get to the part why Dr. Yathain is such an amazing doctor, because pretty much all of these next few slides are things he's explained. So he's explained, we've already explained this. We've already explained this. This we didn't explain. This was just, this is about reflexes, but we're going to talk about it here. In this slide, Dr. Yathain was not explaining what the, telling you, oh, the biceps is this, or the brachial radialis is this, at least not from my batch. For our batch, he was explaining something different. He's explaining the idea of when you have a reflex suppressed, another one will heighten. So really, he's explaining this. So let's say Tom right here, who looks diminished, let's say he's the bicep reflex. Well, by then, uh, Jerry, or Elephant Jerry, or I think this was the Jerry that was an elephant. I'm, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure this was him. And so let's say he's the tricep reflex. And let's say, the, let's assume you know, these reflexes are opposites. But if, this, if the biceps reflex is diminished and the triceps reflex is its opposite reflex, then the triceps will be heightened as a result of the biceps being, um, the biceps being diminished. Does that make sense? I'll just take your silence as a yes. If yeah, not, I can't repeat it. I'm in the chat, but you can't see it. Um, oh, wait, okay. Class, I was, I'll just Some uh, people are asking to repeat. This, so. Sure. Okay, let's repeat. Play. So we have what the doctor is explaining here is not what these reflexes do. Play. Let's understand that. The doctor here is explaining the effect of diminishing a reflex. Let's assume for some reason your biceps reflex is diminished. I know. I mean, it wouldn't be hard because let's I know. play it. What would happen as a result is its opposite reflex. Let's assume that's the break. Let's assume that the triceps reflex would be heightened, and you'll see what these skills are in pro. And there's another slide which explains these skills, which you just need to read. But pretty much the idea here is when one thing is diminished, its opposite will be heightened. Does that make sense? Uh, 
I really hope it makes sense. Uh, I really can't see chat. Uh, if someone could just open their mic and say yeah, or just say what chat's saying, that would be great. Yeah, all good. Alhamdulillah. Okay, Tom. Uh, with this slide, um, pretty much uh, what we we're trying to see, what we're trying to see here is that pretty much these are the reflexes. Dr. Yaqeen could ask about these reflexes, but uh, so it's pretty much your responsibility to know them or take chance that uh, they may be asked or may not be asked, but these are the um, reflexes and uh, they're there and some important dermatomes. Uh, is there an easy way to memorize this? Look at the red, this is first aid. First aid gives easy ways to remember this. And honestly, I think if you go through this, you wouldn't have too much of a difficulty inshallah, but, uh, if not, just let me know and uh, like go through this. And if you still find a hard time, let me know. Inshallah, I'll send an easy way to remember this. Play it. Now we're pretty much almost done with the ascending pathways. We just have to talk about two things, which are the which are the um, two of the tracks. We have to go through two slides. Uh, all right. So there are these slides, which are nice and everything. But personally, I like using these because it's simple. So let's start from the. Um, we we're going to talk about the uh, dorsal column and the spinothalamic tract. The dorsal column, can someone remind me what the function of the dorsal column was? Uh, two touch discrimination, vibration, and uh, conscious proprioception. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, so it's responsible for TVC, two touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception. Thank you very much, my friend. But, uh, what's the pathway of the dorsal column? So it enters at the level of the spinal cord, it goes all the way up, and then it sh at the level of the medulla, it's going to cross over to the other side. It's going to decussate to the other side, and then it will go to it will go all the way to the cortex to its respective centers. But it goes. From this, it enters at the level of the spinal cord. It crosses over at the level of the medulla. Remember this, it crosses over at the level of the medulla. And then it goes all the way up to the brain. The spinal thalamic tract, the difference between this is it will enter the spinal cord and immediately it will decrease. So at the level of the spinal cord, it's immediately going to cross over. So it crosses over, it goes all the way up to the middle, and then it goes to the, um, I'm sorry, Muhammad, it goes all the way up to, um, the, uh, the brain. So, uh, why is this important? Why is a level of decustation important? This is something very clinical. And this is actually, any, and I, just to give you guys an idea, this is where questions could come from, by the way, understanding this concept. But the two, these two tracts, by the way, are, are very important and they're very high yield tracts and they're very important to ask questions from. Um, so do remember these tracts, do remember where they cross over. So at the level of the medulla, we said the dorsal column crosses over and at the level of the spinal cord, the spinal thalamic tract uh, crosses over. So let's assume that we have an injury of our right um, C6, C6 nerve, okay? So because, uh, because the, just one, the spinal thalamic tract crosses over at the level of the spinal cord, it will be injured ipsilaterally. Whereas the, um, the, dorsal column, the injury will appear contralaterally and under. So spinal thalamic tract, if it's injured, it will be it will, at the level of the spinal cord, it will be injured ipsilaterally below. So the spinal thalamic tract, can someone tell me what the function is? Oh, okay, sure. Okay, so the spinal thalamic tract is basically responsible for pain, touch, temperature, and uh, pressure. So the sensation of this will be lost ipsilaterally. The, on the other side, on the contralateral side, if, we, if we've injured the dorsal column of this side, the contralateral, uh, the contralateral side will be affected. So that means in no, the, uh, what's called, we will lose two chest discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception on the other side and below. And you will see this in the syndrome called Bernard, uh, uh, called um, BSS. Uh, uh, it's, a very, it's a very interesting uh, disorder and for us, we'll talk about that more inshallah. And you'll probably understand this more by then inshallah. But just to recap, if we have an injury of the spinal thalamic tract on, at the level of C6, 
that means we're going to have ipsilateral loss of pain, touch, temperature, and pressure. If we, if we have the same injury, but the dorsal column is affected, we're going to have loss of two touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception at uh, the opposite side and below. Does that make sense? Picture may not be very useful, so I just need you guys to listen to me on this aspect. If, uh, if you want me to repeat, I can repeat. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to repeat this. Let's let's discuss. Forget forget understanding the tract. I want you guys to understand the lesion because that's more important than knowing the whole. Like yes, the tract is important, but the lesion is why we learn. Like we learn these tracts to learn the lesion. So what the lesion would be, let's say we have an injury at C6, okay? We're, just, we're not, I'm not using the slide, I'm just talking, let's say C6. If, if it's affected, we're, it's going to be affected below. So below, everything below C6 will be affected in this syndrome, play it. But if, this, if the C6 is affected, on the ipsilateral side that it's affected, let's say you injure your right C6, that means every, the right side below that, you will lose the spinal thalamic functions, which for pain, touch, pressure, and uh, pain, touch, pressure, and uh, so you will not you will not have that sensation at below C six on the right side. In this same lesion, in the same right sided hemisection, which is what it's called, um, in this same right sided lesion where we've injured C six, the opposite side below it will lose the functions of the dorsal column with two touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception. So to recap, if we have an injury of the right C6, we will lose right, uh, right spinal thalamic, which was pain, touch, temperature, and pressure. And we will lose left dorsal column, which would be two touch discrimination, vibration, and conscious proprioception. Does this make more sense now? Yes, thank you. All right, alhamdulillah. But I know it can be confusing, but really, you'll repeat it and it will click. So just go, so just repeat and watch this lecture back as many times as you need to, if you need to. Now we'll go to this track, which is a lot easier. There is, this part is going to be confusing. So I just want you to pay attention to my words when I get to the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. But pretty much, can someone tell me what the cuneo and the spinal cerebellar tract both do? Okay, that's fine. They, they are responsible for unconscious proprioception. The cuneo cerebellar and the spinal cerebellar are responsible for unconscious proprioception. Now these other, these other ones, they have crossing over and things like that. We don't see that here. And again, I know you're probably looking at this and you're like, okay, Lofty, what about this thing? Right, here? I'll get to that, don't worry. But if you were to have any lesion of these tracts, it would affect the ipsilateral side, not the contralateral side. So this is the true for the cuneus cerebellar. This is true for the dorsal spinal cerebellar, the posterior spinal cerebellar. And this is also true for the ventral spinal cerebellar. How? This isn't what's happening. It's actually, let me get out a pen just to show you what's happening. Doing something more like this and here. This is what's actually happening, by the way. So there is, a kind, there, there is kind of an error with the slide. But this is what's actually happening. Yes, it crosses over. That's true but it crosses back. Ultimately, it will affect the ipsilateral side. So if you had a lesion of the ventral spinal cerebellar tract or the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, or even the cuneo, cere spinal, uh, the cuneo cerebellar tract, the ipsilateral unconscious proprioception will be affected. Does that make sense? I'll repeat anyways, just to recap. So we said in the cuneo cerebellar, is uh, it's going to go. Uh, it's going to go to the uh, ipsilateral cere cerebellum. The same thing with the dorsal spinal cerebellar. It will go. It goes from here all the way to the um, cerebellum, and then the ventral also does the same thing. The only thing that may happen is that sometimes it does cross over, and but it eventually crosses back. So regardless, the ipsilateral side will be affected. So if we have a lesion of any of these tracts, that means the ipsilateral unconscious proprioception will be affected. Does this make sense?
Uh, uh, Sorry, I couldn't hear you. What'd you say? I was saying that the, the chat is all good. So. All right, Tom. Another thing I'd like to point out is that th here we have three orders of neurons. The first order at the level of the spinal cord, the second order at the level of the medulla, and the third order at the level of the brain. Here, we only have two orders, spine, cerebellum, easy. Is this that important? No, but it's, a, it's kind of a distinction for understanding why we're grouping them together. So why are we talking about these together? It's not just because they're all unconscious for perception. It's because they kind of just have these two orders and these have the three orders. That is it for the descent, for the ascending tracts. Alhamdulillah, we're done with the ascending tracts. Does anyone have any questions about them? Can you just repeat the last one, just one more time quickly, please? This one right here? Yes, please. Absolutely. Please. Let's repeat. We have, we're here, we're looking at three tracts, technically. We're looking at the cuneocerebellar, and we're looking at the two spinal cerebellars, the posterior, the dorsal, and the anterior, the ventral. Now, they are all, as we said, we agree that they are responsible for unconscious proprioception. Unconscious proprioception. So they are going, and because they are going from one place, they are going from one place to the cerebellum, they're called spinal cerebellar or cuneocerebellar. So with the cuneocerebellar, simple, it's here. You have the accessory cuneus or whatever, goes here, goes to the cerebellum, that's it. With the dorsal spinal cerebellar, same thing. It goes from wherever it is to the cerebellum. With the ventral, it's a little bit complicated. The only thing that, yes, it does cross over sometimes. However, it eventually crosses back. And what the key takeaway is, is that if you have a lesion of any of these three tracts, you will have a lesion that involves ipsilateral loss of unconscious proprioception because they are all responsible for unconscious, for unconscious proprioception and they are all ipsilateral. Is this clear now? Yes, thank you. Of course. Play. any other questions? I'm going to assume not. Uh, do you wanna give them a break, like a five minute break just to relax? Cause I know that was a lot of information to go through their heads. But should we give them a, just a quick five minute break? Yeah, it's totally fine. I can do that, okay? All right, thank you. So we'll resume at 7.53, inshallah. So let me just figure out how this whole thing's work. Oh, okay, good. I can get my laser pointer back. So yeah, go relax. Um, go drink some water, please. Let me just try reach chat just in case there's anything I'm up. Tell them to come back if they want to. Oh, inshallah, I'll just give you guys a few seconds before I start, inshallah. Uh, but I do hope you're understanding everything so far. And if there's anything you need me to repeat up until this point, please let me know. I would be more than happy to do that. But yeah, uh, let's start. This slide, I'm not, again, this slide is not necessarily important per se in terms of questioning, but it's just something you need to understand as a med student, as a potential neurologist, neuroscientist, some guy who likes studying the brain. But the important thing uh, that uh, is from here is why do we have sensory pathways? Why, are, why do we have this whole system right here? And why do we have it set up? So essentially we get a stimulus, Tayyip, that stimulus goes to the sensory cortex through those ascending pathways, which we discussed. It then gets processed into motor stimulus in the motor, pro in the motor cortex, and then through the descending tract, which is what our focus is for now, we're going to use those motor pathways uh, to exert an action. Let's say, for example, that you felt cold, like I do. Um, so you feel cold and your body, your and can you guys remind me what tract is responsible for temperature sensation? Spinothalamic. Thank you. Which spinothalamic? Lateral. Very good. Thank you so much. So yes, the lateral spinothalamic is responsible for, uh, for the temperature sensation. So I'm cold. So my spinothalamic tract would tell my brain, hey, I'm cold. And what my brain would do in the sensory cortex is understand that I'm cold. 
and then tell, tell some other parts of my brain in the motor cortex, hey, start shivering. And essentially, through the descending tracts, I start shivering. So that's just a simple way to understand this. But this is exactly what's happening. When, this is the importance of the spinal cord. It's this very long messenger. And now we're going to talk about the descending tracts. Honestly, there's not like ascending tracts is a lot heavier than descending tracts. So we're not really going to take much time. And there's like one big track and like side, a bunch of side quests. Cool. So here are a lot of words. If you made it this far, I'm sure you can. So you guys can do that. Here, I need to read this. Uh, and the reason I need to do that is because I'm basically going to explain one of these tracks here. So uh, what's going on? Um, we have the two tracks. We have two of these tracks, corticospinal, corticobulbar. We also have other tracks like the vestibular spinal, the reticular spinal, the rubus spinal, but we'll talk about those inshallah. But we have a few important tracts that we need to talk about. We have the corticobulbar tract. They go from the cortex, the cortigo, to the bulbar, which is also the head and neck, which is the um, lower brain stem nuclei, and the one specifically responsible for head and neck uh, muscle movements. Oh. Anyways, so we have these. We ha we have the cortical bulbar goes from the cortex to the lower brain to the lower brain area, and then of course it goes to the head and neck muscles and innervates them. Does anyone know? A head, like an important head muscle in the head and neck system that's, in, that's innervated by a spinal nerve. You learned this in MSK. Do you guys remember that? There's like one muscle that's really important. All right. It's, it's been a long time. I don't blame you guys. Um, but trapezius. Wait, it it... May I? Is it cranium no, on uh, the, what is it called? Um, uh, the one on the ribs? I forgot its name. The boxer's muscle. I serratus anterior. Sorry. Serratus anterior. Okay, so, serrat, no, not serratus anterior, but good guess. The trapezius. Trapezius. The trapezius is innervated by the eleventh cranial nerve. You learn this in brainstem, but don't worry. You'll learn all of the important muscles that the uh, brainstem innervates directly through its cortical bulbar tracts in the brainstem lecture. But you know, I'm just preparing you guys for that even though I should just be preparing you guys for this. So let's go back to that. Anyways, mal corticospinal tract. This is a very important tract. And honestly, we're going to talk a lot about it. And we're going to take our time with it because it's this very big and very important tract. And there are a lot of important concept, concepts. So yeah, the sensory could be from the primary motor co cortex, the premotor, supplementary motor, the primary sensory cortex. Uh, these are the areas where stimulus. It's mainly for the distal limb muscles. In general, any sort of movement is mainly through the corticospinal tract. There's this picture right here. I'm going to explain on this picture first, and then I'm going to show you something that makes your life a lot easier. We're going to start off right here. Obviously, we start from the brain. Uh, we go from the cortex. We go down all the way to the level of the basal pons. At the level of the basal pons, uh, it goes through a side quest. Uh, so um, what happens in this side quest, what's going on exactly, is that the 12th cranial, it's going to supply the cranial, the 12th cranial there, and essentially that's going to supply something you'll learn brain stem. So don't worry too much about it right now. Don't worry about this 12th cranial nerve side for right now. It's just a side quest to you guys at this moment. After it goes to the pons, it goes to the medulla. And this level of the medulla is so important. This is very, very important. At the level of the medulla, it is going to decacy. It means it's going to cross over. And not all of it is going to cross over, 85% of it will cross over. So at the level of the medulla, where is the medulla? Okay, so at the level of the medulla right here, there's going to be, this is called the pyramidal decussation. 85% of the fibers are going to decussate and they're going to form two tracks. There will be two tracks. The 15% will remain and form the anterior cortical spinal tract. And this one, this lateral one, will form the lateral cortical spinal tract. So the ones that remain anterior will be the anterior corticospinal, and the ones that go lateral will remain lateral. Now, what are some important concepts to understand? Now, you probably heard at some point uh, that I think the doctor may have mentioned that 15% uh, at the anterior corticospinal tract decussate somewhere. Did he mention something along those lines to you guys? I'm sure he did, but uh, I'm, and I'm just going to assume he did. And if anyone had has ever heard of that, I'm going to explain what he means. So that doesn't mean they decussate to the lateral cortical spinal tract. They don't go and supply the, the lateral cortical spinal tract. 
they remain within the anterior. They just go to the other side of the spinal cord. Now, what about the lateral corticospinal tract? What's going on here? Pretty much, this 85% is going to remain. And the importance of lateral corticospinal tract is that it is going to supply the limbs, whereas the anterior will supply the axial muscles, the head and neck, the trunk, and things like that. So anterior, axial muscles, lateral limbs. That's one easy way to remember. And lateral has 85%. This has 15%, the anterior. Another idea that I want you guys to be familiar with is the concept of upper and motor lower neurons. And this is defined by the level of the medulla. Above the medulla, they are called upper motor neurons. And below the medulla, they are called lower motor neurons. What's going to happen specifically? I have a slide for that. And I'm going to talk about that in detail. But I'm not going to bore you guys with that right now. And we're going to talk about like spastic and flaccid types of paralysis. Don't worry, we'll get into that. I also want you guys to understand that the anterior corticospinal tract, or sorry, um, if the lateral corticospinal tract is paralyzed, it will be ipsilateral. I just want you guys to remember that. If you just paralyze this nerve, um, it will it will be just ipsi, it's just this side will be affected ipsilaterally. So I just want you guys to understand that. Now, I know for a fact, no one is going to remember anything I just said now. So do you want me to make your lives a little bit easier? You guys, you guys don't need hard lives. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, class, you guys want your lives easier? I'll do that. So I, I, I realize that the notes I have in my writing are so ineligible. I couldn't even understand what I was saying. I had to go through the lecture all over again to make sure I still understood. Because because turns out for my entire life, I have really terrible handwriting. So let's go into this. Let's see what's going on. And then the cortex. The cortex, you have fibers from the cortex. They go to the pons. At the pons, I said they had a side quest. Let's not pay attention too much to that right now. We also have the medulla. It goes from the pons to the medulla. At the level of the medulla, it decapitates. 85% will go to the other side, whereas the other 15% will remain. The ones that go to the other side, the anterior gray horn, they will become the lateral corticospinal tract. Whereas the ones that remain, the 15% that remain, become the anterior corticospinal tract. The difference between these two tracts in function is that A, the anterior is for the axial, and the lateral is for the limbs, the extremity. Another question, so some questions people ask, I mentioned the difference between them. There's also this 15, this side for 15% within the anterior corticospinal. Again, it does not, so it's not 15% that go to the last cortical spinal, it's just 15% that remain. This green line right here, this represents the medulla. The reason is, is because above the medulla, it's an upper motor neuron, and below it is a lower motor neuron. So just to recap, the cortical spinal tract, cortex, pons, medulla, there's a decussation. The ones that decussate, the 85% become natural, supply the limbs. And the ones that remain are axial. They supply the axiom, the anterior cortical spinal tract. But are we understanding it more now? I just want to make sure, at a, at a basic level, do you guys have some idea of what's going on? All right. Okay, a bunch of people are saying yes. Do you want me to repeat or should I move on? Okay. Uh, so, Shakla Fili debate, I'll uh, repeat it moving on. To stay on the safe side, I guess I'm going to repeat. So, just to recap, I'm going to explain just very simply. You have neurons at the cortex, eventually goes to the pond. At the level of the ponds, we said there's a side quest. After the ponds, it goes to the medulla. At the level of the medulla, it decades to the lateral side. So, here you have 85% of them are going to go and form the lateral cortical spinal tract, whereas 15% will remain in the, as the anterior cortical spinal tract. And again, some of the concerns that people had is why do we have 15% uh, crossing over? This is just within the anterior cortical spinal tract, so don't worry. What about the green line? Above the medulla is an upper motor neuron, and below it is a lower motor neuron. And then at the lat why do we have a lateral and why do we have an anterior? The anterior for the axial muscles and the lateral for the limbs, for the extremities. Does that make sense to the person who asked me to repeat? Thank you, for, th thank you for letting me know. All right, great. Awesome. 
let's continue. Play you. Uh, this is a picture. Pretty much covered this. And a lot of animations too. Okay. We've talked about this track, the cortico spinal track. I would ask someone to um, explain to me the cortico spinal track, but um, I has no one really wants to do that. So I'm not going to make anyone do that. Instead, I'm just going to move on to the other tracks. So we talked about the cortical bulbar. We talked about the cortico spinal. Now let's talk about three other tracks that are much easier. Don't worry, they're not going to be as hard as the other as the cortico spinal track. We have this track called the reticulospinal track. It goes from the reticular formation to the spine. Reticular, reticular, reticulospinal, reticular track, reticular formation to the uh, spine. So the thing with this track is it's responsible for reflex modulation. So it modifies your reflexes, and it's responsible. It's it's going to be bilateral. Now this, whether it's bilateral or it goes contralaterally or remains ipsilaterally, is an, is something very important. Um, and that, that's, it's important in the sense that it distinguishes, it's one thing that distinguishes these guys. So reticular formation to the spine, reticular spine, remains bilateral, reflex modulation. The next one is this one right here. This is the rubrospinal, the red nucleus all the way down to uh, the spine. So rubro means red, and I think it's, I, okay, I'm pretty sure this one's Latin, but pretty much this tract is responsible for stimulating the flexors and exciting the extensors. So the rubrospinal, red nucleus, it's going to go and stimulate the flexors, but it's going to go contralaterally. So the left red nucleus will supply the right flexors, and the right red nucleus would supply the left flexors. And this is through which tract? The rubrospinal tract. The next one is the vestibulospinal, and uh, pretty much with this tract right here, it remains ipsilateral goes from the vestibular nucleus all the way down to the spine and remains ipsilateral. So we have this, so again, bilateral, bilateral, ipsilateral, reticular formation, red nucleus, vestibular spinal. They all go down to the spine, but their functions are different. Reflex modulation, flexors are stimulated and extensors are inhibited, the opposite here. Flexors are inhibited and extensors are stimulated. So these two you can think of as direct opposites. And this one is just true neutral where he's bilateral, reflex modulation, and uh, pretty and, and pretty widespread. Play. I know you guys are going to ask me to repeat, so I'm just going to repeat anyways, and I'm going to explain what do you need to know. Reticulospinal, reflex modulation, remains bilateral, reticular formation to the spine. The rubrospinal, red nucleus to the spine, contralateral because it decastates, and it's responsible for stimulating the flexors and inhibiting the extensors. And the last one is the vestibular spinal tract. It remains ipsilateral. It stimulates the extensors and inhibits the flexors. Now, do we understand these? And the reason I'm, I'm like, I'm constantly repeating with these parts is because again, I'm just going concept to concept. I wanna make sure that you guys understand every single little concept uh, that's relevant at least. So yeah. All right, so we're pretty much done with these. Now we go, we have two more things to talk about. One more main thing you really need to pay attention to, but two other things that are pretty important as well. Um, so let's start off with this last very, very main thing. And then I'm pretty much done with the things I'm expected to cover. And this is the idea of upper and motor neuro lower neurons. So upper and mo lower motor neurons are actually quite important because they are, Neurons, obviously, neurons are very important. But what's the importance of each one? The upper motor neuron is more inhibitory, whereas the lower motor neuron is more stimulatory. But what does that mean? So we said the upper motor neurons come from, are in the area of the brain, that's our reference point, and the lower motor neurons are the ones in the spine, the ones under the medulla, specifically. So the lower motor neurons are going to be excited, and they can be inhibited by the upper motor neurons. When we talk about inhibition, a lot of people think that we're just talking about simple inhibition, where you just stop it. But really, you have the thing with the brain is you can perform very precise functions, not because you're stopping at a certain point per se, but because you're stopping, you have enough force to stop. It's pretty much an idea of how much do I need to stop, not all the way. It's like when you're driving a car. When you're driving a car and brake, if you brake all the way, chances are you will get hurt. So you gotta brake slowly and you have to brake a specific amount. 
So just to understand, when we say inhibit, we're not saying completely inhibit. We're saying that it's inhibiting, it, that, that there's a balance between the functions. One of them should be high per se, when we want something to happen. And the reason why we need this inhibition, in particularly, for example, again, like I said, fine movements. So if you're writing, if you didn't have this inhibition to stop at a certain point, then you would, you would pretty much just write in scribbles and we'd still live in caves. But because your lower motor neurons are being kept in check by the upper motor neurons, we actually live in cities now, alhamdulillah. So what now, let's get into the clinical relevance of this. What if we paralyze the lower motor neuron? So if we paralyze a lower motor neuron, this would be a, uh, this, this would be a lower motor neuron lesion, obviously. But because there is no stimulation, because we've paralyzed it, what we would have is something called flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis. All right. Flaccid paralysis due to damage of the lower motor neuron. And most of the time, this is ipsilateral. It's at the point at which this, this lower motor neuron is affected, you'll have ipsilateral flaccid paralysis. Why? This is a balance. The balance between upper and motor neuron, lower neurons is important because it's a balance of stimulation with the lower and inhibition from the upper. So these upper motor neurons, because the lower motor neurons aren't stimulating per se, the upper motor neurons are basically going to be more overpowered and, you'll be, and your functions will be inhibited. And therefore, you'll be flaccid. The opposite is true for um, the upper motor neuron lesions. So let's say we did, let's say we paralyzed this nerve, this upper motor neuron. What's going to happen is that this lower motor neuron pretty much has nothing stopping it. It's like, it's like nothing can stop this lower motor neuron. So pretty much what happened is that you can spasm. So they call this a spastic type of paralysis. So lower motor neuron lesion, is a flaccid type of paralysis, whereas upper is a spastic type of paralysis. And also in terms of direction, lower motor neuron is ipsilateral flaccid, upper motor neuron is contralateral spastic. So we said spastic because the lower motor neuron is not being inhibited. And um, we said flaccid in, uh, in lower motor neuron because uh, the upper motor neurons have more power. I know I said a lot of words and I will repeat because I know you guys need me to repeat. So I will do that. So upper motor neurons are inhibitory. So if they are paralyzed, what we're going to have is spastic type of paralysis because we don't have that inhibition. If we have a lower motor neuron lesion, because there's too much inhibition, we will have a flaccid type of paralysis. And that's essentially what I want you guys to understand. Why is the upper contralateral? That's a very good point. Uh, uh, let's go back to this picture. Let me also pull up the slide to make sure I'm giving you guys the most accurate information possible. Play it. When we play, uh, I want you to just write in chat. So uh, let's look at, like we said, and no, here the upper are the upper motor neurons, right? The upper motor neurons are above the medulla. Now, if you notice in both the anterior, and again, I'm saying, I'm specifying most of the time, by the way, but most of the time, when you have this lesion of the upper motor neuron, uh, of the upper motor neurons, it's above the medulla meaning it's before it decussates. So if you injure it, if you, if you injure this right side, the left side is going to be affected because it crosses over to the left side. And the opposite is true for the right side. Does that make sense? Sorry guys, my AirPods died. Let me just um, plug in the other one. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So uh, to the person who asked that question, I hope it makes sense. Okay, someone's very excited saying yes, thank you. Uh, I'm also excited to be here. Essentially, we've explained this, all of these concepts. And here is something, I know it's very low quality. The only thing worse than this is my handwriting, but uh, pretty much here, it's just a nice table. You will learn this in physiology and you'll understand this more in physiology, by the way. But please pay attention to what Dr. Shoaf says. He's very good at explaining and he loves uh, and he, he really loves neuro as a whole. He does, he's very, he specializes in neuro and he's very good at explaining it. So please do pay attention to him. Uh, no, don't be sorry. I appreciate, I, I honestly was very happy for a second. Uh, I thought you were excited to be here. <laughs> but anyways, 
So there are things here that you will learn in physiology, inshallah. So I'm not going to do that. If you still don't understand them after, contact me. You guys have my contact information by now. Tayyip. That's it from the things I'm obligated to explain. So from the upper, from the descending tracts, do you guys at least, do you guys think that if you look back at this, you would understand it more? Okay, someone is saying yes, thank you. Definitely, okay, that, uh, that makes me feel really good. Played, definitely, great. Now, I know that someone else was assigned this lecture, the lesions, but there are some things I just want you guys to understand just because I feel like they're pretty basic, which is the definitions. So monoplegia is one limb, di means two, both limbs, para, whether it's upper or lower. Para means both lower limbs. And if you, if, uh, has anyone here ever seen Family Guy? Yes. Okay. If, uh, tell me why? Why did I, why did I bring up Family Guy? Uh, Joe Swanson. Exactly. But what does he have? So paralysis of the both lower limbs, so paraplegic. Exactly. Thank you, Yusuf. But yeah, well, for paraplegic. Think of Joe Swanson. He is uh, a para, he is a paraplegic, and somehow still in really good shape. That's the beauty of cartoons. Hemiplegia is paralysis of, of one side. So pretty much the upper limb, the torso, the lower leg. And we also have quadriplegia, which is all four limbs. And again, uh, we, there's something called spinal shock. You can pretty much just read this, but pretty much it's immediate loss of uh, spinal reflex function. So um, you have incontinence, slow heart rate, low blood pressure. You guys can read Mishabwa. But uh, here are, here's something I want to leave you guys with. And like I said, I love drawing. And I love, I love neuro. Neuro is such a beautiful block. And I really, especially neuroanatomy, I really love neuroanatomy. And going through it was very fun. And drawing all of this was very fun. So for the spinal cord lesions, I've pretty much drawn them out. I have two slides for you guys, which you can read on your own. It explains the lesions. If you're capable enough to read my handwriting, if not, please just send me a message. I'd be more than happy to uh, help you. But pretty much what we see here is we have the different lesions and we have uh, where, where they're affected. I've drawn where they're affected and their symptoms uh, and things like that. And this right here, BSS, this is also called hemisection of the spinal cord. I love using this one right here to explain, uh, for example, the uh, sensory tracts because I feel like it does a very good job of that. And of course, Dr. Yaqeen loves BSS. So make sure that when whoever is explaining this lecture, this spinal cord lecture, lesions lecture, make sure that they explain BSS well, because Dr. Yaqeen loves this one. He even says that in class. I think he told you guys if you took that lecture already. Here's another slide. Um, and I do write in code sometimes. This skull means death. So if you have any questions about something that doesn't make sense, just text me. That's it. That's, we're pretty much done with this. So thank you very much for attending. I'd be more than happy to take any and all of your questions. And of course, you can get through this. You can defeat Nero. It is defeatable. People have done it and you will be the next to do it. And inshallah, next year, you will be telling people how to do it. I know that for a fact. But yeah, thank you guys. Any questions? And now I can check chat, by the way. So I will read. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you. If you guys don't have questions, um, just please uh, has, don't hesitate to ask me. Whenever you have questions, I'd be more than happy to help you. You can reach out to me on my WhatsApp, email, yell. I don't care. But just I want to make sure that you guys understood. And I really do hope that I made sense today. I know it's not an easy lecture, but I hope it made a little bit more sense today. Well, inshallah, you guys will get through this. Allah, you're welcome.